everybody, my name is Ella Gould and I'm delighted to join you at this year's National English Speaking Union competition, albeit in slightly different circumstances. Throughout the course of the evening, despite being divided by screens, we are all being brought together by the talent and passion of everybody here today. Speaking of talent, I'm overjoyed to be joined by our questioner, Christopher Wood, and our delightful speaker, Flo. Christopher has a deep interest in psychology, so hopefully this will help him to really dig with his questioning and further enlighten us on the topics that Flo will be discussing. In their speech, they are going to be exploring a quote by Winston Churchill. It is a fine thing to be honest, but it is also very important to be right. Will they wholeheartedly agree with this statement, saying that being seen as right is paramount, or will they take the opposite stance and enlighten us on why perhaps being honest is all that is needed? I can't wait to find out. So I'm extremely happy to hand over to Flo. I hope it will be honest and more importantly, right to call them brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. We've all heard of Winston Churchill. We see him on our five pound notes, but perhaps for our generation, he seems a more distant historical figure. But does he still have relevance today? Well, let's look at a quote from Churchill from almost 100 years ago. It is a fine thing to be honest, but it is also very important to be right. Back in the 30s, he was one of the very few politicians in favour of rearmament. He spoke in opposition to the then Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, who was known as Honest Stan and whose honest opinion was that it was morally wrong to fund weaponry in preparation for another war after the horrors of the last one. That was an honest view, but not the right policy when Hitler was threatening peace in Europe. What does this quote mean for us today? Well, sometimes saying what you honestly think is not always the right thing to do. The fact is, words have consequences, and that is the thing that people all too often forget. In my speech, I'm going to look at three different examples of this from three different continents. One from our own country, one from the United States, and a third from the other side of the world in New Zealand. Let's start with someone we've all heard of, JK Rowling, author of Harry Potter. Back in June 2020, she took to Twitter to share her honest opinion about why trans women shouldn't be allowed in women's bathrooms. I'm not here to argue as to whether her opinion was right or wrong. The question is whether she was right to broadcast it to her 14 million followers on Twitter, causing hurt to many trans people. As a celebrity, like it or not, your words matter and saying them has consequences. And the consequences here were some women thinking trans women were dangerous and the trans community being tarnished by this misinformation. It is not enough to be honest in your opinion. You have to also be sure that it is right to express it if you are a public figure like J.K. Rowling. Secondly, let's look at another big figure on Twitter, or at least someone who used to be. Until he was banned, Donald Trump had 88 million followers. If J.K. Rowling could make an impact, he could make one six times as big. The tragic death of George Floyd last year sparked huge protests in Minneapolis and other cities. As tensions mounted, Trump, as president, had a responsibility to calm the situation. But instead, he picked up his phone and tweeted, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Now, I've had some defenders of the president claim that that's just a statement of fact, and that people were genuinely, honestly scared in that moment of anarchy on the streets. But while those fears may have been honest, was it right for Trump to play on them? The consequence of his words were people were angered more by the president's insensitive response to the protests and rioted as a result. Had he responded differently, these riots might have been preventable. Now, let's go to the other side of the world to see how a different leader reacted in the crisis situation. In March 2019, there was a horrific terrorist attack at the mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand. A white supremacist with a semi-automatic shotgun entered the mosque and killed 51 people. He live-streamed the attack on Facebook. The honest reaction of most people was to be appalled and angry towards the attacker. But was anger the right reaction for the country's leader to express? 
The Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, had a different approach. She recognised that by live streaming it, the government was trying to stir up anger and hatred. So she decided she wouldn't say his name. She asked people instead to say the names of the victims because words matter. And she turned the nation's reaction from one of hate to one of compassion. And the consequence of that was people came together to help each other heal. Instead of dividing the country, she brought it together. Back in the 30s, Churchill was sounding a warning of what was to come. And we should take these words as a warning to us today. Our society is becoming more divided. People have honest opinions and some hold them very strongly. But some public figures, whether deliberately or not, are broadcasting opinions based on fear, which can easily become hatred for the other side. So this is a warning. A warning to not let our not politics be driven by passion. Honesty isn't always the best policy. Thank you, Flo, for that really moving and enlightening speech. I'd now love to hand over to Christopher, who's going to pry into some of the intricacies of it a little more. Thank you, Ella, and of course, thank you, Flo, for such a truly fascinating insight into whether honesty really is the best policy. Um, just to start off, you mentioned how maybe you need to consider if it's right to express your opinions. How do you think me as an individual can quantify if my opinion should be shared as it is correct? I think that's a really good question. I think it's just thinking, the idea of thinking before you speak. So we say we have to be honest, but honesty isn't just throwing your opinion out there. It's thinking beforehand, what is this going to do? So what we can do as individuals is just think, is this going to have negative consequences if I say this or if I express this opinion? And using that to bring that into our lives. Thank you. Um, just to follow up from that. So if I consider my opinion to be not um, hateful towards another group of people, but the receiving end do find it hateful, who should, um, uh, in a way, police this system? Do you think it should be done on an individual basis or if it should be controlled by the wider, such as the social media companies? I think that's a really good question. I think it has to be on an individual basis because while social media does have a responsibility to make sure people aren't being hateful towards each other, we can't rely on them to censor things after they've been taken out. We have to do that ourselves. And so thinking before you say something, you can be honest, but you have to be careful of what you say and what it's going to do. So um, you mentioned Trump in your speech about how some of the direct links between some of the hateful things he said on social media and um, the, the real attacks on people's property and lives in Minneapolis. Do you think that perhaps we should take more steps in this real world to stop this hate being spread on social media? Or should we, as you said, consider our opinions before we put them on social media to try and stop this in the real world? That's a really good question. I think it's a mix of both because you have people use social media all the time now. It's such a big part of our lives. And so it's become a part of real life. So they're interchangeable now and you can't separate them. So what you say on social media is going to affect real life and real life is going to affect what happens on social media. So it's the two mixed together. Thank you. I think uh, we have time for one more short question. OK, thank you. Um, our current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is a known um, supporter, should we say, of the Mr. Churchill. He's written many autobiographies about him. If Churchill was still here today, what do you think a conversation, perhaps, would go down between the two? In what context, what would they be talking oh, about? Oh, sorry. As in, if... If Churchill was still here today, what words do you think they would exchange? I think if you talk to Boris Johnson about all the things I've been focusing on today, I'm saying think about the policies you're going to make and think about 
what how they're going to play out and think about how people are going to react to them as well and it's all really about thinking <laughs> about what you say and what your actions are and the fallout effect of what they're going to be and the consequences of what they're going to be and that's what church would say to him i think thank you that's brilliant thank you krista for your questions and thank you flo for your really emotive speech now in the beginning of their speech Flo talked about how people in a place of influence need to be especially careful because especially in their position, their words matter. They have mass followings and they could affect huge amounts of people. For example, with Donald Trump, he was playing on the worries and fears of people looting and the worries and fears of people in America and potentially provoked the storming of the Capitol. Your words matter. So I think the real message of Flo's speech is can we use our words to unite instead of divide? I would love to thank Christopher for his questioning, Flo for their speech, and our illustrious judges for hosting this event. It was so lovely to speak to you all and thank you.